Are you looking for answers in these unprecedented times? Are you wondering what the future holds? Maybe you just need a church family to be a part of, or maybe you need prayer for something that's going on in your own personal life. Come join us every Saturday at 10.30 a.m. in our journey as we search the scriptures and learn and understand what God says in His Word for us in our lives now and in the future. If you're unable to make it in person, watch one of our sermons on YouTube or Facebook. God bless as we await the soon coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
Hello, everyone. Glad that a lot of you came back. I had the opportunity to talk to some of you out there, and um, it seems like a lot of you have a lot of knowledge on these things, which is really amazing. It's a really good start to sort of unpack um, some of these concepts. So now we're going to get into part two, and it's not going to be as long because you guys have some food to eat. Now it's getting close to like nap time. So we're not going to make this one too long, but I'm going to leave the opportunity to have a little bit of a discussion afterwards. Any questions? So we're just going to start with the New Age movement. I almost want to skip this slide coming up because I, I misspelled the word. I missed a T. I don't know. It's should have put it there, but that's okay. So the rise of the New Age movement. So the New Age. And again, here, let's go to Encyclopedia Britannica. The New Age movement that spread through the occult. That's how it spread. And the metaphysical religious communities in the 1970s and 80s, it looked forward to a new age of love and light and formed a foretaste of the coming era through personal transformation and healing. The movement's strongest supporters were followers of modern esotericism, a religious perspective that is based on the acquisition of mystical knowledge that has been popular in the West since the second century AD, especially in the form of Gnosticism. Ancient Gnosticism was succeeded by various esoteric movements through the centuries, including the Rosicrucianists, um, through Rosicrucianism in the 17th century, and Freemasonry, Theophysy, and ritual magic in the 19th and 20th century. So, like we were talking before, these things, the New Age movement, is just repackaged. It's, as some friends would tell me, it's for the white man, the, the New Age movement. It's so easy to accept and so easy to swallow because it's already been cleaned up of the, um, the things that seem so mystics. So Gnosticism, the word, uh, it comes from the word gnosos, which means knowledge, to know something, to know something that someone else doesn't know, secret knowledge. What's the, philosoph the philosophy of the New Age movement? Well, the idea of perennial philosophy is central to the New Age movement, as we've discussed. Its central precepts have been described as drawing on both Eastern and Western spiritual and metaphysical traditions and infusing them with influence from self-help, self motivational psychology, holistic health, parapsychology, consciousness research, and quantum physics. The term New Age refers to the coming astrological age of Aquarius. And, um, you know, many say that we live, we're living in this age of Aquarius now. Continuing on with the philosophy, the new age aims to create a, spirit, a spirituality without borders or confining dogmas. It's very ironic because it is the opposite of that. It is inclusive and pluralistic. It holds to a holistic worldview, emphasizing the mind, the body, and the spirit are in our all interrelated, and there is a form of um, uh, monism and unity through the universe. It attempts to create a worldview that includes both science and spirituality and embraces a number of mainstream sciences as well as other forms of science that are considered fringe. So I found this very fascinating. Pew Research, New Age believes common among both religious and non-religious Americans. You see, oftentimes Christians will think to themselves, well, look at these guys, you know, with their, you know, pagan uh, beliefs and all this kind of stuff. And the reality of the matter is that the research shows quite the opposite of that. Most American adults self-identify as Christians, the majority of the Western world, but many Christians also hold what are sometimes categorized as New Age beliefs, including the belief in reincarnation, astrology, um, psychics, and the presence of spiritual ener energy in physical objects like mountains or trees. That's pantheism. Many Americans who are religiously unaffiliated also have these beliefs. Interesting. Overall, roughly six in ten American adults accept at least one of these New Age beliefs. It is not hard for me to say that at least everyone in here at one point has held on to a New Age belief. Specifically, four in ten believe in the uh, psychics and spiritual energy can be found in physical objects, while uh, somewhat smaller uh, shares express belief in reincarnation, 33%. That's a big number. And astrology. So this is something that is very, very ingrained in the fabric of our society. It's very popular. It's not just a few people. 
So according to uh, Neville Drury, the New Age has a tangible history. And we've, we've gone through some of it today. It has a very tangible history. Although Hangriff, these are um, scholars, Canadian scholar and British scholars, expressed the view that most New Agers were surprisingly ignorant about the actual historical roots of their beliefs. Isn't that true? Similarly, and by the way, that goes across not just New Age people, but also people who hold on to other, uh, whether it's denominational Christian, uh, Christianity or Catholicism, you name it. That is the most uh, prevailing fact that most people are um, ignorant about their beliefs. Similarly, ha Hammer thought that source amnesia was a building block of New Age worldview, with New Agers typically adopting ideas with no awareness of where those ideas originated. As a form of Western esotericism, the New Age has, um, well, how can, I, how can I can't say that word all of a sudden? That's, uh, these, um, these teachings come back all the way from uh, Southern Europe into the late antiquity. Following the age of enlightenment in the 18th century in Europe, new esoteric ideas have developed in response to the development of scientific rationale, which we saw happening uh, with the rise of Darwinism in the uh, late 1840s and so on and so on and continuing. Scholars call this new esoteric trend occultism. And this occultism was a key factor in the development of the worldview from which the new age emerged. So why do I have all these slides on here? The point is to prove that everything that we talked about earlier before is what is behind the New Age movement. So a key, a key concept in the New Age movement is new thought. This came in the late 1800s as well under a lady named Mary Baker Eddy, and uh, she started the Christian science movement. And of course, we talked about this a little bit before. She claimed that Christ was speaking to her directly. Um, I went straight to the history books um, with this author here, The History of New Thought, From Mind Cure to Positive Thinking and to Prosperity Gospel. Prosperity Gospel are those mega churches in which they tell people you just have to pray hard enough. You just have to imagine um, you know, Christ just dropping all this money into your bank account. It's all the same. It's all rooted in the same uh, line of thinking. So the New Thought is both a movement and a uniquely American philosophy, one that emphasizes the power of mind over matter and challenges his followers to visualize their way to wealth or health and success. Uh, the historian Holler, the exploration of New Thought is not only about people and organizations involved, but the way that their ideas were embraced and disseminated through popular culture. He traces New Thought back to the earliest beginnings in the American rejection, which is very interesting, of the Calvinist theology. Uh, healing teachings of Franz Anton Mesmer and the visionary theology of Emmanuel Swedenborg. So, the contemporary New Thought movement is loosely allied with a group of uh, religious denominations, office, um, authors, philosophers, individuals who share the set of beliefs concerning the, the metaphysics, mindfulness, positive thinking, the law of attraction, healing, life force, creative visualizations, and personal power. New Thought holds that infinite intelligence, or God, is everywhere. The spirit is the, to the totality of real things, true human self Hood is divine, divine thought is a force for good, Sick, sickness ori originates in the mind, and right thinking has a healing effect. So I think we're all kind of seeing these concepts before somewhere in our lives, but this is very popular everywhere we go. And I find it very interesting when we go to Encyclopedia Britannica, which talks about what, what are these... Um, you know, these practices of the New Age movement, they are very clear. They say traditional occult practices. Tarot reading, astrology, yoga, meditation techniques, and mediumship were integrated into the movement as a tool to assist personal transformation. So it's a little bit of, a little bit of everything everywhere. Transpersonal psychology, which we talked about, an approach to combining Eastern mysticism and the Western rationale to understand the psychology and the spiritual well-being. And other new academic uh, disciplines that study the state of consciousness encourages the belief that the consciousness altering practice, such as Zen meditation, could be practiced apart from the particular context in which they originated. So they say, well, we can strip the, the uh, religious spiritual element from it and just use it as a technique to help people. Moreover, many other techniques used to achieve personal transformation were enlisted in the effort to bring about planetary healing and social transformation. So what are some other key people? I'm um, not going to get into a lot of these, but Franz Mesmer, he's a father of hypnosis. Um, we have Carl Jung, 
Uh, everybody's familiar with Carl Jung. He's a Swiss psychiatrist, psychoanalyst who founded analytical psychology, very, very steeped into the occult and New Age teachings, Annie Besant as well, and the Theophysy Society. So, in the 60s, this is where we see the rise of the New Age movement in, the, in its new form in America. 1960s is a decade that changed everything, Life Magazine. In the 60s, it was part of the counterculture movement, the New Age movement. According to author Andrew Grant Jackson, George Harrison's adoption of Hindu philosophy and Indian instrumentation in his songs well, with the Beatles in the mid-1960s, together with the band's highly publicized study of transcendental meditation, truly kick-started the human potential movement, which is the New Age movement, and su subsequently became the New Age. So there was something happening already with the music, with the Beatles. They were incorporating a lot of these uh, Hindu teachings in their music and a lot of the instrumentations as well. Um, one of their cover albums, I forget which one it is, they are dressed with uh, traditional Hindu um, apparel, and they've sneaked in a lot of instrumental occult people in the image. In fact, they said that they tried to sneak Hitler into that image somewhere in there. I didn't see it yet, but um, he's supposedly in there. So this decade also witnessed the emergence of a variety of new religious movements and newly established religions in the United States, creating a spiritual um, milieu from the New Age, which the New Age drew upon, including the San Francisco Zen Center, Transcendental Meditation, Soka Gaki, and Inner Peace Movement, the Church of All Worlds, and the Church of Satan. So the law of attraction, this is perhaps one of the most popular um, practices in the New Age Who's familiar with the law of attraction? Yeah, a lot of us are. I've read, um, I've read countless books that are sort of the repackaged. There was this book that I read, um, what was it called? It was called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Anyone read that book before? Yeah. Um, Napoleon Hill composed this book in which he kind of gives you the secrets in which you can achieve success and wealth. I read that book countless of times, and then I go and I read the history, and yeah, he was very much steeped into the occult and this idea of the law of attraction. So this is a belief that if we think positively and have faith, we will get whatever we desire from the universe, which is the ageless wisdom. The law of attraction is based on the idea that like attracts like. Teachers of the law of attraction will often tell you to believe, imagine, or visualize what you want from the universe and she will make it true for you. What other, what other core tenets? We have meditation. Meditation is a huge element. I mean, yoga studios are popping everywhere across our countries. The United States, Canada, you can't go anywhere. Every town has a yoga studio. So why? Meditation has become one of the core tenets of New Age spirituality, with recent research touting its physical, mental, and emotional health benefits of meditation. A lot of people have opted to access this technique in order to promote their own total well-being. It's, a, it's part of this package of completely um, improving yourself. Even those who still identify with an organized religion, such as Christianity, can benefit from meditation because it promotes relaxation and the idea that it's non-intrusive to one's pre-existing beliefs, which is false. Uh, meditation is a way of cultivating inner stillness and bringing oneself closer to the divine. Companies such as Amazon, I was looking the other day in the UK, Amazon has set up these little hubs in the middle of U UK and, and, and London um, where people can go in there, they can just take a little break from their work, they can sit in this uh, sort of porta potty type thing in which they can meditate and they'll have sounds coming in there and they have this opportunity to be at ease. We have apps like the Calm app. Some, some of you have seen that Calm app before. And various administrations have uh, meditation as a staple. We're seeing something in society where we sort of reach this point where uh, we can say that you know, depression, mental illness, is just captivating our society. And a lot of these people are saying, yeah, it's because we're missing this spiritual element. But then the question again always becomes, which one are they bringing in, and why not one over the other? Seems like there's an agenda in mind. Transcendental meditation, it's one of the big ones that um, it's described to having such great benefits. Jerry Seinfeld, Ellen DeGeneres, Howard Stern, these people always talk about it. Uh, the technique involves the use of silent used sound called a mantra that is practiced for 15 to 20, uh, twice per day, 15 to 20 minutes tw twice per day. You're not supposed to tell people what your mantra is. It's supposed to be between you and the universe. You're not allowed to tell people. 
It is taught by certified teachers. Um, it's a little bit expensive. I looked at some courses online. Um, the technique has been seen as both religious and non-religious. Sociologists, scholars, and a New Jersey judge court are among those who expressed views on it being religious or non-religious. The United States Courts of Appeal upheld the federal ruling that it was religious in nature. This is one of the many that took place, and eventually some of these things went to the Supreme Court, and they said this cannot be taught in schools. Well, mindfulness meditation. This is the big one now. Mindfulness is a practice of purposely bringing one's attention in the present moment without uh, evaluation. And you know, we were talking a little bit before, there is a lot of small truths in these things. You, we should live in the moment. We shouldn't worry about tomorrow. Let tomorrow worry about itself. There is truth to that, but it starts to invoke these religious um, Eastern elements. It's a skill one develops through meditation or training. Mindfulness drives from sati, a significant element of Buddhist traditions based on Zen Vipassana, the Tibetan meditation techniques. It is the seventh element of the noble Eightfold Path. And for those who don't know, the Eightfold Path is the steps required to reach nirvana and hence immortality, reincarnation, constantly coming back. There was a song a long time ago, I, I believe it was, um, Maybe, uh, maybe Willie Nelson or one of those guys, they made a song together and the concept was that they kept coming back as these different things. One was a raindrop, one was uh, someone um, running a spaceship, but it's this idea that we will never die, we're immortal, we'll keep coming back. And that's the purpose. You could come back as a leaf, you can come back as an elephant, and uh, this is where we have terms like deja vu, where you experience something that you felt like you've experienced it before because it was something that happened in your other life, your other reincarnation. And uh, we'll get to that in a second. This is the father of Western mindfulness. This is the man that introduced mindfulness into the psychology curriculums and into the schools. It's coming into the schools now. Um, when people talk about mindfulness, especially when people are taught um, as um, you know, students of sociology or psychology, they just are told that you know, we have a lot of research on something called mindfulness, but they'll never show you a picture of this guy who is the father of Western mindfulness, John Kabat-Singh, and I'm pretty sure he changed his name too. Uh, Kabat-Singh was a student of Zen Buddhist teachers. Um, he, you know, he spent a lot of time in his life learning about this thing. His practice of yoga and studies with Buddhist teachers led him to integrate their teachings with scientific findings. He teaches mindfulness, which he says can help people cope with stress, anxiety, pain, illness. The stress reduction program created by him is called MBSR, and it's offered by medical centers, hospitals, uh, health maintenance organizations, schools. There is a push in a lot of these big corporate uh, organizations that I know people um, that work in these organizations as I was um, in that world at one point. They're always bringing these uh, mindfulness practices into the workplace to kind of restore their employees back to a normal state. What they don't really realize is the work that they are doing is what is uh, killing them and they're just trying to uh, propagate them and keep them afloat with these kinds of things. So I, I had to make that distinction here. So uh, Christian meditation, because there's always this idea that they can all be the same and they're all very similar. But I wanted to make, I wanted to put it in here. And again, this is from um, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. Christian meditation has a very specific focus, which is for humans to communicate with God. Christian meditation usually involves incorporating the Bible or scripture as a vehicle through which Christians can hear the voice of God. Christian meditation, like forms of meditation, also emphasizes on becoming focused, non-judgmental, and centering oneself. However, Christians see the growth of their faith as being highly collaborative with God. Thus, the goal of this type of meditation is not to become blank or transcend reality, but it is to sit, rest, and connect with God. Very, very different but very close. Large studies have shown that Christian meditation to drastically reduce stress and anxiety and depression. Of course, the Bible talks a lot about meditation. Um, the Psalmist David wrote, you know, um, let me meditate on your words daily. So this is a practice, but it's very interesting how there's always a counter to every single one of these things. And again, we always have to ask ourselves why. Crystal healing, I mean, this is huge, um, a lot of rocks. People collect rocks for certain healing practices. Crystal healing, 
again, I'm just reading from the sources, is a pseudoscientific alternative medicine practice that uses semi-precious stones and crystals such as quartz, uh, amethyst, opals, um, all types of rocks. Adherents of the practice claim that they have healing powers. There is no scientific basis for the claim. Practitioners of crystal healing believe they can block low energy, prevent bad energy, release block energy, and transform um, bad, uh, the, ba the body's aura. While the practice is popular, it fosters commercial demand for crystals, which can result in environmental damage and exploitive child labor to mine the crystals, um, which I found was kind of ironic in some ways. I think they, it's mostly young girls working in uh, India, making about 10 cents a week um, getting these stones so that people can go through these, um, these practices, finding, because the idea is if God is in everything, God is in these crystals and special crystals do special things. The first historical documentation of crystals originated from the ancient Sumerians. Uh, the Sumerians used crystals in their magical formulas. The origins of crystal healing is also tied to ancient Egypt, Mesopotamia, India, ancient Greece, and ancient Rome. Tarot cards. You know, this one was really interesting because um, they weren't always what they are now. Tarot cards originally were just a regular cards. They were just a deck of cards. Tarot cards um, was started by this man here, was a French occultist who was the first person to popularize tarot divination to a, a wide audience. In 1785, and therefore the first professional tarot occultist known to history who made his living by card divination. Uh, he published his ideas of the correspondence between the tarot, astrology, and the four classical elements and the four humors. I gotta stop for one second. Um, there's always been this element in that um, if you have a regular deck of cards, you have 52 cards. You know, they're supposed to represent the 52 weeks in a year. You have the, uh, the four suits, which are the, the cycles of the earth and things of that nature. So things have always been incorporated into a lot of the things that we do. But tarot cards were really just an old Italian game. Um, they had no, none of this spiritual element until it became that uh, later on. So he read this really interesting book. Uh, he claimed to borrow hev heavily from the book of uh, Thoth, an Egyptian text supposedly written by Thoth, an Egyptian god of wisdom. He gave the meaning to each of the cards, incorporating beliefs about astronomy and the four elements. So, who are the spiritual leaders of the New Age movement? I took a quote uh, from this very popular New Age magazine. It said, Hermes, Buddha, Jesus, Rumni, spiritual leaders have been with us for a long time as the world has been around. We have read their books, listened to their words as songs or poetry, and created religions around them. They are vital for the evolution of human souls and they provide necessary wisdom to help us move forward in our spiritual journeys. So what they're trying to say is that, you know, it's not just these guys, it's other people too. There's been a lot of spiritual leaders and I love how they put peop every, every single one of them on the same line as if Hermes, Buddha, and Jesus could, could share, the same, um, the, share the same pedestal. And um, so th this is a belief that there can be many spiritual teachers. It just doesn't have to be just these guys. So who knows this lady? Rhonda Bryan? She's, maybe you've, maybe you've never seen her face, but you've definitely seen her book. She's um, Australian. Her new thought book, The Secret, again, this is all from the sources, is based on the law of attraction. After the death of her father in 2004, um, Brian or Byron became very depressed at the instigation of her daughter Haley. She read The Science of Getting Rich by Wallace Wattless. It was the same thing. She discovered positive thinking, the laws of attraction, and how to find further success in life. Hence, she started doing research on the subject and the project uh, of The Secret was born. Wallace Waddles was a member of the Christian science movement started by the cult leader and spiritualist Mary Eddie Baker. So you'll see all, the, you see all these connections taking place. I don't know if I have it on here, um, so I might as well mention it beforehand. The first time the word, the concept, law of attraction was in a book, does anybody want to guess who was, was one of the first people that we talked about in this presentation? It was Helena Blavatsky. She was the one to coin the law of attraction and, um, and, and hence talk about it a lot more. So the secret. I told you guys to remember what this album art looked like. Do you guys remember the first book that I told you to remember? It's very similar, right? Uh, the cover of the book. This is the secret because she took these things from the writings of Blavatsky. 
How influential was it? Well, it sold over 30 million copies. That's a lot of copies. It was translated into 50 languages filled with promises of helping you get everything you want in life through their law of attraction, the concept of visualization. I used to have, um, there was a period in my life, um, I've been an entrepreneur forever, and so naturally my God was money and I had this board of visualization where I had a car, I had the house and all these things and you had to look at it you know, every day and remind yourself. And I'll be honest, there's a lot of truth to this stuff. There is, there really is. By beholding, you become changed. And there is some power behind it. Um, but again, we have to ask ourselves, what power is behind it? The book was heralded by the New Age movement as groundbreaking. The movie and the book grossed over $300 million. That's not including um, every other type of uh, uh, novelty item that came from it. In total, uh, some of the estimates I saw were close to a billion dollars. So the law of attraction. In the New Thought Spiritual Movement, the law of attraction is a pseudoscience based on the belief that positive or negative thoughts bring positive or negative experiences into a person's life. Again, there is some truth to these things. The belief is based on the idea that people and their thoughts are made from pure energy and that a process of like energy alike, uh, attracts to like energy um, through which a person can improve their health, wealth, and personal relationships. There is no empirical scientific evidence supporting the law of attraction and is widely considered to be pseudoscience. I will say that I do believe um, there's a verse that says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. There is truth to these things, again, but it's who are they taking the attention away from and what is the overall um, goal with these things. And they try to flip things and put them upside down because Gnosticism is just flipping everything upside down. In the garden, the serpent, Lucifer, which is the Logos, gave the wisdom to Eve and God or Jesus is Satan. This, so they have this upside down flipped view and all these things. This is why we get all this confusion, by the way. Some would be surprised to know that the law of attraction appeared in print for the first time in the book written by the Russian occultist Helena Petrona Blavatsky. Uh, John Stackhouse Jr., a Canadian scholar of religion, put it like this, it isn't new and it isn't a secret. So shamanism, huge practice today, huge, huge practice. Um, I recently uh, talked to someone who had been to one of these shaman rituals and you know they laid on this table and had this shaman come and do healing over them. And this person had experienced pain throughout their life because of an accident in their leg. And you know they, they started like this, and by the time they were finished, their hands were up in the air and their pain was gone, and they haven't experienced pain since then. So um, this is something that's happening a lot. You know, I, I've known some people personally. In fact, where I live in Kelowna, there's a lot of people, young people, that go to shamans for this sort of spiritual healing. Now, it's, this is very this is different from uh, some of the, the shamans that you'll understand in the native culture, right? And that's a, that's a different conversation, but um, very similar things taking place. So it's referred to as neo-shamanism. New Agers will typically visit shamans. Just as in ancient times, contemporary people consult with modern day uh, shamanic practices for uh, practical and prag uh, pragmatic solutions to problems in their everyday life from personal illness, professional challenges, or family discourse um, and ancestral, is uh, uh, ancestral issues. And yeah, I've talked to some of these people who go and, you know, they have this experience where the, their body is like they're convulsing, right? And some of these guys in LA, for example, uh, some of these shamans make like $1,000 an hour just having people come to them, typically very rich people in LA, and have this experience where they tell them like, oh no, you just have this negative energy because of this person that you're with. And it has nothing to do with like really realizing your fallen nature. It's always... Um, pointing at other issues. Deepak Chopra, um, huge, huge figure in the New Age movement. Deepak marries spirituality and science and specifically medicine. However, he has a multifaceted focus on meditation and the history uh, of the history of most spiritual leaders. He has written over 50 books with the seven spiritual laws of success being the, the New York Times bestseller list for 72 weeks. I read this book. Um, the Seven Spiritual Laws of Success. It is very interesting now that as I look back on it, I can see uh, where the concepts come from. Deepak Chopra blends Hindu philosophy with science to create the ideas he shares with others through his books. Unfortunately, his ideas are not new, and 
and his teachings um, can be found in the writings of the, theoso the Theosophical Societies and the Occult. Other people include Alan Watts, Abraham Hicks, and Barbara Hubbard. So, some new age terminology. I thought I'd maybe help you guys out to, to realize some things. Maybe you've seen these before. Uh, there were so many I could put on here, but I decided not to. Um, chakras, the seven energy points on the body. Yoga is, practi is practice through the chakras, the crown. Chakra is naturally on top of the skull. And sort of to explain that a little bit more with yoga, the belief is, is that there is a snake inside the man, wrapped inside the man, the kundalini, that needs to be released. And in practicing these yoga practices, you're able to release the snake from within you, and that is at the top of the head, which is very fascinating. Agent, a person sending a telepathic message, um, imperishable records of every person's every thoughts or acts inscribed in the earth or spiritual realms, allegedly from outer space. We talked about ascended masters, those who suppose, supposedly reach the highest level of uh, spiritual consciousness. The ascension of Christ. This is reinterpreted in a mystical way to refer the rise of the Christ consciousness in mankind. I've talked to so many people who, talk, who tell me about Christ consciousness, but I don't think they realize what the Bible was saying uh, as opposed to what the occult says about Christ consciousness. It describes awareness that the man is divine and the attunement is the new age counterpart to prayer. So what are the beliefs of the new age? Just to kind of wrap up, what are the core tenets of the new age? So afterlife and salvation, new agers accept the concept of reincarnation and believe the future rebirths allow the individual human souls to slowly develop itself towards a higher spiritual state. You know, I've always asked myself if reincarnation is a real thing that's been happening for a long time, like we should have a lot of people technically that have reached all these uh, high levels, but we don't. Right? It's been billions of years, uh, according to them, of how, how long this is happening. Billions of people have been reincarnated, yet we have uh, very few people who've reached this supposed state. Ultimately, they will await the coming Maitreya. And I think that is important to know. As we look at the world, as we were talking earlier today about, you know, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. This is about spiritual warfare. When you think about World War II, now think about World War II from a spiritual concept, because that's the reason why it took place uh, in the first place. You know, people thought they were fighting German soldiers for, for certain ideals, but really they were fighting against other ideals they had no understanding of. And what becomes really interesting is that the Muslims are waiting for a God to return. The New Age people are waiting for the Maitreya. The occult is waiting for the Maitreya. Christians are waiting for the second coming of Christ. Atheists, well, a lot of them fall into the New Age, but if they don't, a lot of them are waiting for aliens to show up. Um, but every single person on this earth, for a great percentage of people, they're all waiting for someone to show up. Isn't that fascinating? So. Who are they going to, who, who's actually going to come? Because everybody thinks someone is coming. And uh, there might be some deception lying in there. Suffering in the problem of evil. Well, the yin and the yang, right? Uh, the New Agers believe that human minds create its own reality and that suffering and evil exist as illusions created by the mind. The law of karma determines how and when individuals experience suffering throughout their lives. So there's this yin and the yang the dark and the light, and one cannot exist without the other, and that we must experience suffering and pain to be able to truly enjoy uh, life. And I think there is some, there's some truth to that, but there's a lot of deception in that as well. Now, if you tell me that the only way that we could ever really be happy is to experience pain, well, I don't know about you guys, but depression, trauma, all these things really are just so prevalent in our world. Do we really need to go through this? Do you think the human mind was really created to experience the type of pain that it does? I don't think so. And the understanding of the black and the white, the positive and the energy, uh, and the negative energy, all a necessary factor, does not mingle with the reality of what we see happening in our world today. 
So the ultimate reality in the divine beings. New Agers generally believe in the impersonal deity that is present in all beings. Since each human being contains elements of God, New Age practitioners look to develop that divine spark and their awareness of it, that divine spark, that thing that, you know, is that started the whole world, that what is that, you know? That is what they're looking for. And again, that's where we get the positive and the negative um, to get that spark going. It's all one, so it's all good. Moral relativism, right? Even that term in and of itself is self-defeating in and of itself, saying that there is no real truth, that truth is relative. And we have this idea in our society today of moral relativism. Does it work? It doesn't seem to be working. Many New Agers tout concepts such as right and wrongs as dualistic and therefore invalid. They try to convince us that everything is okay because we're all one. This is the dangerous moral relativism. So, coming to the, coming, we get closer to our conclusion here. So what's the big deal? What's the big deal? Well, while most New Agers claim that the absence of religion and not to be discriminatory, they lack familiarity with not only the writings of various deities, they uphold, they uphold, nor the history of how these teachings came to be. So they try to be very neutral. And again, we've all done this before. I think a lot of us had this element of, uh, of that in us. But they have no regard to the writings, these historical writings of different religions and how they're all contrary to, the, uh, to each other. They're all speaking in complete uh, opposite to each other. So, for example, the idea held that all religions are the same is false, um, or the idea that all major gods such as Buddha and Christ are in agreement with each other. The problem with this is that upon inspecting the writings of each of these various religions and gods, they all claim to be the only way to truth and not to look anywhere else. Ultimately, every human must decide which God was true and correct by establishing real historical evidence that proves their existence. But one cannot blend any of them as they are in total contradiction to each other. Well, what's the other problem with it? It's nothing but Gnosticism. This is little known to the New Agers along the proponents and the proponents of the rise of spiritualism, though some did know this. Almost universally, scholars agree that the New Age movement and the rise of spiritualism is only a recapitulation and an old counterculture movement, which is exactly what the New Age movement and spiritualism were. Uh, spiritualism was so. The old Gnostic movement was really started to put a, a stop to Christianity. This was immediately after the uh, the death of Christ and his ascension. This Gnosticism came up right after, which is why we have the what are called the Apocrypha books, the books of the hidden knowledge, the book of Thomas, the book of, um, of uh, just so many, book of Enoch. There's all these writings that are just Gnostic writings. And when you read them, you can really tell. So I love this author. I was going through some of her writings, and uh, she's a historian. The Gnostic New Age, how a counterculture spirituality revolutionized religion from antiquity to today. She tells us that Gnosticism is a countercultural spirituality that forever changed the practice of Christianity. Before it emerged in the second century, passage uh, to the afterlife required obedience to God and the king. Gnosticism proposed that human beings were manifestations of the divine, unsettling the hierarchical foundations of the ancient world. Subversive and revolutionary, Gnostics taught that prayer and meditation could bring human beings into an ecstatic spiritual union with a transcendent deity. This is all old stuff. This is, this is 200 BC. This is, this is uh, nothing but um, recapitulated old things. This mystical strain affected not just Christianity, but many other religions. In fact, um, it's very much believed by a lot of scholars that the Gnostics are the ones who started these Eastern mysticisms. The idea that like, you know, Buddha did reincarnate, the idea that he lived afterwards, because for everybody in that time, historically, they understood him just to be a man that died, and that's all that happened. But there was all these things that came up afterwards, and it's believed the Gnostics had a huge part to play with that. You see, most Gnostics did not even believe what they taught. It was a movement to destroy the rise of Christianity. In fact, in the readings of the letter of John in the New Testament, we can see that the Bible apostle was dealing with Gnosticism in his church in Asia Minor, pre-second century. He mentions the word no dozens of times in his writings to his churches with phrases such as, you know the truth, you don't need to know anything else. John continued to let his church members know that he was there and handled the physical Christ who then ascended. This is important because the ideas that were contrary began to rise shortly right after. 
And years later, this developed into a theological system known as Gnosticism. It's blended Greek dualism with Eastern mysticism. It adopted the dualistic view that not only non-material or spirit was good, while anything material was evil. Along with this came Eastern mysticism, which focused on secret knowledge reserved for a chosen few. Though present in seminal form in the late century, uh, first century, it blossomed to a full expression in the middle and later second centuries, thanks to the Gnostics. By the middle of the second century, its adherents were producing their own gospels and epistles, of which the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Judas are just some of the examples. And uh, I've actually talked to a lot of Christians before who told me, hey, but have you read, you know, these books that were like the hidden books of the, of the Bible? Like they don't want you to know, like there's all this knowledge. And little do they know that they're just Gnostic writings. They're not in any way uh, correlated with true historical events that took place that are recorded in the New Testament. Oh, my clicker's not working here. Oh. Oh, I guess, I'm, yeah, I'm reaching my end here. So, the conclusion. You know, we've gone through today with how spiritualism came to rise. We talked about some of the key figures. We didn't even get into in, in total detail and depth of everything that they taught. But I wanted to show you guys, I wanted to take you through this, the scope of things, that this is just old teachings that have been re capitulated so that many could be deceived. And that's the reality of this matter. And when you really study this, you kind of start to see that there's a total onslaught on Jesus himself. There's a f specific focus on lowering him so others can be lifted. There's a, a specific focus for him to be removed and others be made the focus. Why is it that you know, these people who were getting prophecies from these, uh, from these other ascended masters were all of Eastern origin? Why did all of them keep telling them to bring Eastern teachings into the Western world? Unless it was for a specific reason. And as we see what has come out of this, six in 10 people have New Age beliefs, it succeeded. It, it, really, it really has succeeded, and a lot of people go throughout their lives with no understanding of why it is that they believe what they believe. And I'm, today, my, my call to you is to really dig deep and to really ask yourself, am I doing this and I know what it means, or am I just doing this because someone told me or it's what's popular in society or whatever? I really encourage you guys to really start to investigate these things, and you'll come down to a very simple conclusion. All these people worshipped Satan, and their teachings are really just to uplift him, because for him, everything goes. And then there's this man, Jesus Christ, who's trying to tell people, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And then all these movements are to say that, no, 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 that cannot be, that cannot be it. We must spend, you know, a whole deal of money, a whole deal of publications to make sure that does not happen. So you need to ask yourself, what is that reason? And I encourage you guys to study the Bible. I encourage you to look into there and you'll find things that is in, inexplainable to, to the human mind, to see these truths that are buried in there, these pearls, these gems of truth, and there is no other book like it containing such information. So that is my call today. I hope this presentation was a little bit of a taste. You know, we scratched the surface on a lot of these things, and I've talked to some of you guys afterwards uh, personally, and I'm totally into sharing more information, having more conversations, but um, this, is, this is my presentation for today. I wanted to see if anybody had any questions. Um, anybody wanted to share anything? We could, we could have a short discussion. No pressure if there's nothing, but if anybody wants to say something, I know some, some people may have been involved in these kinds of things. I have myself been involved in a lot of these things before. I thought they, um, you know, they could be the same. I thought maybe all the religions are the same. Did you, oh sorry, do you want to share something? Go ahead.
It is. It is because, you know, we have, um, there is a lot of truth to alternative medicine. There is. I mean, we should take care of our bodies. We should try to not just be consuming pharmaceuticals. I mean, there is also an agenda to um, give everyone pharmaceuticals and do all that. And the, and the New Age movement does, you know, uh, sort of tap into that, you know, the, the truth that we have these alternative, uh, alternative treatments. The problem is, is like you're saying, it just goes into this whole other realm, which can be very dangerous. And I will say there is, um, there is power in those things. I mean, I used to practice the law of attraction and, you know, I found myself doing very well. Like financially, I was doing very well. I was finding myself in positions with people that were, you know, very prominent. And I had, a, I was on a path to a very successful future and, you know, success in the eyes of perhaps you know, the world, as, as you will. But the moment that you start to not go in line with the law of attraction, a lot of bad things start to happen to you for some reason. And it almost seems like this entity that we're playing with has this ulterior motive because if you do continue in the law of attraction, let's be very honest, it's very destructive, right? This idea of just get everything that you, that you want, that's not what you need. Right? So it continues you on this path, and the moment that you pull out from it, well, destruction is, is lying. And uh, that definitely happened to me. And, you know, putting this presentation together, I really realized, you know, we were just talking earlier, uh, women were very prominent in this movement. Very, very prominent. And not only that movement, but a lot of religious movements. And it was interesting for me to note that... All of these women, all, all, all of these women, all, all of the women were getting prophecy, you know, quote unquote prophecy, automatic writing. They would go into trances and get these visions. And it's really fascinating because, you know, we've accepted a lot of these teachings that came directly from that. But there are people, and including myself, um, that were very, you know, rightly so, I would say, skeptical to maybe trying to read some of the writings from other people who have claimed to have that sort of, uh, that maybe God was giving them, you know, these visions and stuff like that. But we so easily accept the other one, but we don't even, we don't even want to touch that. That seems like an occult, that seems like a cult. We don't want to, we don't want to get near that. And um, we're very weird like that, or how, how our brain works. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it was very interesting to put this together and share it with you guys. It's opened my eyes about a lot of things. Some things I knew already and some things I didn't. And I really realized how, um, how I could not touch like even a, a fifth of this conversation in, in a presentation. The psychology, the world of health, all these areas are very spiritual. Um, so it's important to know if anybody want to say anything else. Go ahead. Oh, maybe I have to turn it on. Check, check. Whatever. I don't know if it's working. <laughs> I'll pretend. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you, first of all. You asked me. Nobody asked me. That's why I don't know. It's okay. Is it on? For, forgive, forgive them for they know not what they do. <laughs> well, if, if you want to, we can probably hear you if you want to project in here. Um, I, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you. And, and um, one key ingredient, and it's, it's so awesome, is how God judges our hearts. And a, a key ingredient to all of this with understanding of, with, with anything in life is intention. And I'm sure that you, during your research and stuff, imagine, I could only imagine a Christian or someone saying, you're researching that? And then, then they start demonizing you in the research of, but your intention was whatever your intention is. And that's one thing you didn't, you didn't share today, but um, yeah, because if someone, for example, has, a, has an intention of, hey, I just want to fit in, or I just want to make it look good, or what depends on what their intention is, and they start looking because they're looking for an answer, answer external. But if if someone is saying, <laughs> I, I want the, I want the intention to know what the truth is for what, so then I can I can help save others, or maybe God is calling called you to have this understanding, and it all comes back to, I, I've I've met it a uh, hundred times, so I just wanted to say my, my hat's off to you, 
literally, um, and with uh, with continuing to to bear through this because I'm sure you've been accused. I've been accused all kinds of things. I go to all all kinds of different churches and stuff, but one thing people don't see is my intention and what am I trying to do? And and um, yeah, we don't, we often we don't look deep enough yeah. um, within each other, and we end up looking external. We end up looking at someone else. So we'll say, "You read this, so thus you are that." And it's like, no, you need some perspective. You need to know intention, backstory, what God's doing in me, what is doing, and that. And if, unless we can look at all those pieces, we don't have a clue what another person's doing, and we're actually fulfilling. We we imply an intention. I have this intention, so thus you, now you have this intention. Mm -hmm. And often we'll um, imply a bad intention when we're afraid of something because it's much easier to just say, oh, you, you must be doing something bad, so I'm going to avoid you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's it's true, Th and thank you for sharing that. You mentioned something about intention, which I think it's important to touch on because there's a lot of people that, you know, are unknowingly doing these things, and we should not look down on these people. Um, we were all, and some of us are maybe perhaps feel like we are, in sharing a lot of these beliefs. It, this, the intention is not to um, you know, demonize anybody or criticize anybody. I believe there's a Bible verse that says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. And I think that's what we need to do. We just need to bring the light to people, to shine light in the darkness. So I, I mean, I absolutely agree, and thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it can get uh, pretty dark when you go down the pathway of these things and you start reading the writings and you're like, wow, what does this even mean? And then you really have to investigate what it means. So it's, um, yeah, it was quite the journey, for sure. I, and I just wanted to add one more thing, especially when, from my pers perspective on that, is when I would go into all these and understanding and then being met with other people and their accusations. There's been, I've, I've been met by two different pastors, for example. I, I went through what I meant through. I got guided to a church, uh, and then right away I was like, you're, you're demonic. And I was like, what? I haven't even, I've, I, got, I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm in need. I was crying. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't have money to pay my bills. That's because, and they just went, spouted all this off. And then through the forgiveness, I realized, okay, there's a deeper path. Like, forgive them for they know not what they do. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay. And, the, and then it was like, again and again. And then you, I just had Thanksgiving dinner with one of the pastors. So, oh, that's great. Yeah. And, and I was singing one of my favorite songs, which is, uh, Thank You, Jesus, and uh, how forgiving. Like your enemy now seated at your table. And I was mm -hmm. singing that at his table and didn't realize. I'm like, oh. Mm -hmm. And I was just kind of came full circle there. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, that's great. And I wanted to share one more thing I totally forgot. But um, if, we're, if we're being honest with ourselves, I think we're all on this quest to find out what the truth really is, right? Like we all really want to know what is the ultimate truth. And I think if we're, if we're open to that idea and if we're willing to put our pride aside that maybe what we know is wrong, and maybe we need to um, go over here and investigate. I think when we come to things with that sort of um, idea, and I think you'll get somewhere because that is the quest we're all, we're all on. We want to know what truth is. And sometimes I, um, you know, I, I have these uh, meetings with uh, Mormons sometimes and, and Jehovah Witnesses. They're, they're very active in the community. Um, they do a lot of great stuff, and you know I'm always very envious of how much work they do. And I always talk to them, and I say, hey, if you guys are willing to put it all on the table, let's examine every prophet from uh, Joseph Smith to Mary Eddie Baker to Ellen White to Muhammad. Let's see, like, let's test it. Let's see if it's really true. And if your heart is really open to that, you will go down uh, that pathway, and you'll really want to explore. So I think, you know, let's rem let's remember to. Um, you know, have that kind of spirit in which we want to find out what the truth really is. Okay, I think we will, I think we will close on that. Oh, I had a quick question, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Um, I, I actually um, am around a lot of people a lot of times that uh, don't have any concept of this stuff, and, and, they don't, and they don't really want to believe it. What would be a good way of approaching some... Uh, uh, like I have a brother who's uh, basically an atheist, um, a, a totally science. Everything about it is science, um, and uh, so if I bring up anything about spirituality or spiritualism, he doesn't want to hear anything about it. Mm -hmm. um, however, he's noticed that our world is right messed up right now, and that mm -hmm. is a big thing for him. Like he's 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 as I said, he's pro science, 
but he notices how, how th science is being forced on us, and he doesn't like that. So I'm, I'm always interested to know how, how to start conversations with people. I also have another person that I know really well that uh, um, whenever I talk about the spiritual realm and all that kind of stuff, they're, they're Christians, and they just they, they don't want to believe that, that, that our world could be um, completely controlled by evil. Well, for, let's start with the Christian person. For them, I would uh, quickly direct them to the Bible, which is the whole point is that there's a war between good and evil. I mean, if you miss that uh, concept, you miss the whole thing. And maybe that there needs to be a reevaluation there if you're really a Christian. And as far as the, the uh, you know, your atheist friend, you know, we always have to remember, I think atheists, um, you know, are some of the, the best people to talk to, actually. Um, I think one of the most successes that I, you can have with people that are atheists is the morality conversation. Because you, you gotta get to the fact of where does morality come from, right? And ultimately you're gonna find out that morality, as we know it, comes from the Bible. And we, if we, they have this belief that they can create a new morality. And obviously that's not working. So maybe having a morality conversation about like, do we need morality to run a society? Where does morality come from? Is love just a chemical, uh, a chemical reaction in our brain? Is it really? I mean, we, we need to have those types of conversation in which we uh, sort of help them uh, provoke our minds. Like we needed that at one point, I sure did. And we need to meet people where they're at and not be judgmental. Um, there's always a, a passage in the Bible that says we need to be all things to all people. And that for me requires me to become knowledgeable in a lot of different things so that we can be there for people. Because what, what, um, you know, what other purpose could I have you know, than trying to understand what people are coming from and being able to help them? So I think we need to become knowledgeable in all these things. And then when you have a little bit of knowledge, you're able to talk to them and have very more intellectual conversations that hopefully will spark the mind. And then, of course, a lot of prayer is always a great way to go. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I don't even know what to think. Like, yeah. um, because this is my second time here, and like, yeah, there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on. Sure, yeah. And I feel like it's been drawing me to a lot of real beautiful people mm -hmm. that's been helping my life because I was in a terrible place like for the last eight years. I was in a, was in a relationship and it just it got toxic or whatever. And now I'm just uh, being able to explore myself. But um, um, there's been a lot of manifestation. Like I'm hearing what everybody's saying. Uh, and it's, it's, it seems like it's bringing me to these great, loving, kind people mm -hmm. who are awake to what's happening in the world, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, I, like, I, I don't know. Like, I want to follow you or whatever that is. Like, I don't mean, like, Instagram, but I mean, like, just I want to pick your brain more or, or see what you're studying, but also I'm, like, I don't know. I'm just really confused right now. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And you know what? Um, thank you for your honesty because that's, that's, a, that's the thing that we need from people to just share things like that. The first thing I'll say is um, I would redirect you to Amazing Discoveries. Uh, it's an organization I work for uh, with professors, uh, doctors, like all these types of people who are very knowledgeable on these things way more than I am and people that have actually researched the occult for many years. Um, we have amazing presentations. So uh, we could definitely send you a series that you're probably very interested to watch. It's called Total Onslaught. It's about 36 episodes. Episodes, but I think that you would find some really interesting information there. Now, I would say that you were drawn here today for a reason. And I think, it, I, I, I'll tell you, I don't believe in coincidences whatsoever. I think you're here for a reason today. And, you know, I think I don't want to get into all these things right now. And maybe we can have conversations later on. But let's start with that, the fact that you're here today and that maybe there is something for you to learn today. And, you know, Sometimes I believe that the Holy Spirit 
is, is working through people and talking through people. And you seem like a gentleman to me that really wants to know the truth, that you're really seeking and you're very sincere. And I see that in you. So um, I, what I will say is continue to seek, continue to look into these things. And I think you'll find your conclusion. I think you'll find your answer. And um, I'll leave it at that. I don't want to give you, you know, do this or do that. I think, I think you need to study for yourself and find out like what is really there. Uh, well, you can, uh, you know, I can, I can give people links. If you go to uh, YouTube, Amazing Discoveries, you'll find a YouTube. It's got 150,000 subscribers, so you'll see it on there. You go to playlists, Total Onslaught will be there. We also have a website, adtv.watch, where you have so many things to explore. So many of your questions are on there, and these are things that you need to make up your mind with at the end. When it's presented to you, you need to come to your own conclusion. It's not how I feel, what I think, it's what is this telling you. So I, I can definitely provide people with those resources uh, as we leave, and I'll keep in contact with anybody that wants to keep in contact. I, I love doing this kind of thing. I think meeting people and sharing is the best part of life. So thank you. here and, and that you're so vocal and you have so much to say and share with us and um, Fukando, you're a wonderful answer but I would say for you to really pray in the name of Jesus for the Holy Spirit to help you understand because you're here for a reason amen I just I'm like I just I don't know I, uh, you know I'm like um, I'm here But I just have a hard time grasping yeah. the, the, with the Jesus and with the God in that sense. Like I grew up on a reservation and there was a hall and they go, they go worship and pray there. Mm -hmm. And I would see people fall down and convulse and shake and, mm -hmm. you know, raise their hand and all that. And uh, it became this thing. And my, my grandparents, like my Muslim and Kukum were in there and all that. And then... Um, I just felt this thing going on with uh, churches and stuff and, and, and indigenous people and, and schools and all that. And so I feel there's a little bit of resistance Absolutely. with me with it. And when, when, I, when I hear those words, um, I just, I'm not sure how to take it and absorb yeah. it, right? Yep. And then when I'm doing the spiritualism or whatever mm -hmm. it is, right? Um, it's like it's... Uh, it's servicing me in a way, mm -hmm. you know? Like, yeah. it's like, oh, wow, this is coming. And, oh, how'd you get the free winter tires? Oh, I manifest it. You know, mm -hmm. how'd you get those? Yeah. I manifested the table and the chairs. And yeah. so I'm just really confused right yeah. now. Yeah, and you know what? That's an okay place to be. And let me tell you something on that subject. Do, do not let ever, do not ever think, because people do something in the name of, of God, that it is of God. The, the, uh, the atrocities that happened with the residential schools, that, that, is, you know, that is something that none of, nobody in this room would agree with. And that actually would be a fraction of Christianity, if you could even call it that. We, we very much disagree with that. See, you're talking about Catholicism, and then there's Protestantism. And you see, when you start to study the Bible, you'll realize that the Bible predicted the rise of the Catholic Church and what it would do. And not only did it do that to indigenous uh, children, it also killed 50 million Protestants, people who disagreed with the teachings that they were teaching them through oppression, through darkness. You cannot read the Bible for yourself. We're going to tell you what the Bible says. So this has been happening through a long time throughout history with this specific movement. And, and we, again, we could talk about these things a little bit more, but never think that because someone does in something in the name of God, I'm telling you right now, I've been hurt so many times in the church by people who are supposedly Christians. It, it has nothing to do with God, right? So just think about that. And, you know, like I said, I, I would love to talk to you for, forever on these things, but I, I think that, you know, you have to look deeper, you have to investigate, you have to watch, and you have to really be open to it. And I think you are. And you'll come to these conclusions by yourself. And trust me, I've had a struggle with those things too. You know, who is this Jesus? Because the God of the Bible and the God of the world, two different people. I, I, I'm not, I do not serve the God that people represent, you know, this Christian God, 
That's not the God that I know in the Bible. That's people's representation of God. But the God in the Bible is very different than what the Catholic Church says, what a lot of these denominations say. So, um, yeah. So all you need to, all we all need to do is have a relationship personally with God. And one thing the Catholic Church had, for example, is they always wanted to have someone in between, and trying to always put, oh, I'll, I'll represent you towards God. And it's like, who is this person that thinks the they're, they're representing in between? <laughs> well, that, and that's that's a good point. You see, the Pope stands as Christ on earth, the Vicar of Christ. There's no such thing, man. There's no need to go to a confessional room and say these things to someone that's called your father. The Bible says, call no man father, except that one which is in heaven. So there's a lot of these things that are not true, and they've uh, definitely given a bad name to true Christianity because that's not what it was until they rose to power in 538 as a religious and political power. So there's a lot of investigating to do, man, but when you really see it, you'll really start putting some pieces together. You'll find really interesting. Uh, we'll take one more comment, and I think then I think we should close. Yeah, I just wanted to let guys know that you can talk to um, Reading Wolf here, who was in residential schools. He was actually um, really in line to be killed, and he was able to escape by the grace of God. And uh, he has lots to share on that. And I think, you know, um, he's indigenous. I'm also indigenous, but I didn't I didn't have to go through any of that. I do have my own story how I lost my mom through. Um, the racism and the stigma that was attached to that. But yeah, you know, like, we're here for you. you. We're your family yeah. now. <laughs> okay, we'll talk to Running Wolf. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. All right, guys, we're going to, you know what? Let's, let's actually close with a word of prayer. Let's do that. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for bringing everyone here today. We know everyone's here for a purpose today, Lord, for a reason. There were so many obstacles in the way for me to even be here today. And Lord, I know I was here for a reason. And I thank you so much for being able to share this with all these individuals, Lord. And I pray that you keep working in their hearts, that they may come to know you, come to know the true God, Lord, who, who loves them unconditionally, who paid the penalty on the cross for something that you didn't have to do, but you told us way before through your scripture that you would do this for us. And so we thank you for your sacrifice, Lord. And in the name of Jesus, Lord, with everyone in this room, I just ask for a special blessing and the Holy Spirit to be with everyone that is in this place today. And may we all have a bond and a relationship. May we be friends, call each other brothers and sisters, and be able to be there for each other, regardless of the situation, Lord, with our hearts not full of judgment, but full of love and desire to, um, to be there for each other. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. Are you looking for answers in these unprecedented times? Are you wondering what the future holds? Maybe you just need a church family to be a part of, or maybe you need prayer for something that's going on in your own personal life. Come join us every Saturday at 10.30 a.m. in our journey as we search the scriptures and learn and understand what God says in His Word for us in our lives now and in the future. If you're unable to make it in person, Watch one of our sermons on YouTube or Facebook. God bless as we await the soon coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, folks, I want to say thank you for watching our programming. But I would also like to invite you to further our ministry by liking and subscribing, both to YouTube and Facebook. That would be wonderful. God bless you.